Welcome everyone to NJPAC's Business Partners Roundtable, the Art Center's virtual conversation series with leading executives. Uh, I'm John Schreiber, the president and CEO of NJPAC, uh, and, and I'm delighted uh, you've joined us. Before we start, I want to thank our Business Partners Committee Chair, Joel Sherman of Atlantic Tomorrow's Office for his help with this series, uh, and our friends at PNC Bank for sponsoring NJPAC's Roundtable events. Uh, and I am extremely grateful to NJPAC board member Karen Young of PwC for her indispensable assistance in organizing this event, which I recall us talking about uh, pre-pandemic, uh, which is hard to believe. Um, today, we have convened a remarkable panel of senior executives to talk with us um, uh, about how their organizations are advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion both internally and in their communities. Uh, please join me in welcoming first Debbie Dyson, president of ADP National Account Services. Debbie, who has 30 years experience in client relations, operations, and general management, previously served as corporate vice president of ADP's client experience organization. Debbie is also the executive sponsor of ABT ADP's business resource groups, including Women in Leadership, Cultivate, a group she co-founded uh, for African-American Associates, and Pride, which brings together LGBTQ Associates. Welcome, Debbie. Um, we are also joined uh, by Charles F. Lowry, Chairman and CEO of Prudential Financial, Inc. Prior to assuming his current roles, Charlie served as Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Prudential's international businesses. Earlier, he was president and CEO of PGIM, Prudential's global investment management business. I and everybody at the Art Center are extremely proud that both Debbie and Charlie are members of NJPAC's executive committee. And finally, uh, please welcome Tim Ryan, US chair and senior partner of PwC. Tim is responsible for setting the strategy for the firm's 55,000 employees and partners and serves as the chair of PwC's US Board of Partners and Principals. Tim also worked with a small group of CEOs to launch CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion, which is now the largest CEO-driven business commitment to advance diversity and inclusion in the workplace. To lead and moderate today's discussion, I'm very happy to welcome Sharon Epperson, Senior Personal Finance Correspondent for CNBC, who also contributes to NBC's Today and NBC Nightly News. Sharon is not just an expert on personal finance, she is also an author and an adjunct professor at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs and its Graduate School of Journalism. If you'd like to ask uh, one of our panelists a question, you can type it into the Q&A box. You can find the Q&A box when you hover your cursor at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, Sharon will be monitoring the Q&A throughout our chat and will ask some of your questions. As we have 45 minutes for our session, I regret that we'll not be able to include uh, all the questions that are submitted. Uh, and, and so now, Sharon, if you will, let's begin. The floor is yours and thank you so much. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for having me and thanks to NJPAC for inviting me to host this discussion. I know that it will be a very fruitful one and I wanna encourage all of you to engage and to ask your questions as well because this is a rare opportunity to have these executives with us um, to share their thoughts on purposeful leadership especially as it pertains to social justice. You know, over the last year and a half since the death of George Floyd, there have been many pronouncements by companies about what they will do to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's interesting to look now, a year and a half later, to see actually what has been done and what steps are being taken now compared to what was said that would, be, would happen at the very beginning. So Charles, I wanna ask you first, what were some of the immediate steps that were taken at Prudential a year and a half ago in terms of promoting social justice, diversity, equity, inclusion, and what are you doing now? Sure, Sharon, thank you. Well, following the murder of George Floyd, uh, we deepened and accelerated our racial equity and social justice efforts, which had been underway for several decades, but 
not to use a, a, a trite phrase, but, but this time was different. And as a result, we created nine commitments to advance racial equity, which we shared with employees and then published on our website, which was something very new and very different for us. And one of the themes you'll hear me talk about is during this, uh, during this session is the importance of transparency. And these commitments were born out of 125 racial equity listening sessions held last year in which more than 7,000 employees participated. And within each of, of the commitments we made, we outlined specific actions that we, we would take on, on three different topics. For our people, through our business and in society, and our commitments included ambitious multi-year goals. They weren't gonna be things that would, would happen overnight, uh, but that challenged us to be bold. And while we're pleased with the progress that we've made over, over the past year or so, we recognize there's a lot more hard work to do because real, real lasting progress will only happen through sustained focus and effort. And we're committed to continuing that work after the headlines fade. And we're committed to being transparent about what's working and what isn't working as we go through this, both internally and externally. And that's that's very different for us. Yeah, in terms of being transparent, if there was something that you had to say has worked extremely well, what would that of those nine areas that you mentioned, what would you say has worked extremely well and what you had no idea how much longer and how much further you had to go on it? The, the two areas I would say is one, we publicly shared for the first time data on employee diversity, including EEO1 data and the results of our pay equity and analysis in our sustainability report. And that was, that was very different for us. Uh, it showed where we were last year, where we are this year. Uh, it showed where we need to make significant progress going forward. And, and we're, we're good with that. We want people to know. Uh, where we need to make continue to make progress as we go forward. I, I think the, the, the hardest aspect of uh, inclusion and diversity is inclusion. And we can talk about that more later if you wish, but uh, diversity numbers, to get numbers up, I, I won't say it's easy because nothing is easy, but it is doable. To create a culture of inclusion, to really have people feel included, to be seen and heard for who they are, that is really difficult work. Uh, and that takes time. Absolutely, absolutely. Debbie, I wanted to turn it over to you um, as someone who has been working in the area of advancing diversity, equity, inclusion for a very long time throughout your career at ADP. What have you noticed um, in terms of what the immediate steps were that happened a year and a half ago that the company was very focused on and what is happening right now? Yeah, you know what, uh, thanks so much, Sharon, for the, for, the, for the question and then the opportunity. I mean, it's a deep passion you know, for me. And what's interesting, it, it didn't just start a year and a half ago. Uh, you know, these issues that we're talking about today have been you know, um, in the spotlight or relevant for quite some time. I think, you know, unfortunately due to the pandemic and the fact that we were all sort of enclosed at home, it really sort of thrust all of this media attention on just a series of unfortunate deaths that happened. And I think as, you know, Charlie was talking and, you know, I don't know if you noticed the subtlety on, as you said, death, he changed it to murder and it's powerful. Us having these types of conversations now are conversations that perhaps we would not have had we would not have had. If we were, they were probably isolated in a room, enclosed in our own four walls, and we were talking about opportunities where we could perhaps advance diversity, equity, and inclusion, but we weren't taking it outside of the walls. And I think today what gives me optimism is the fact that, you know, I'm sitting on a panel here with two esteemed peers, and we're having this conversation, and it will be um, bold, it will be probably uncomfortable, but it's exactly what we needed to do. And I think at ADP, again, while we were focused on it, we had to acknowledge that there was a problem. We had to provide education and communication. We as leaders, every leader from the top down sent messages to the entire population within ADP about how we were feeling and what this meant to me, Debbie Dyson as a human, as an African-American woman. And then we started to have conversations and similar to what Charlie was talking about, there was just series and series of 
sessions where we just let people talk. This wasn't trying to be structured. We weren't trying to dictate the conversation, but it was go where you need to go in order to heal um, and to share your pain. And I think that was uh, cathartic in its, uh, in its own way, uh, but I do think it thrust awareness in a much broader light than we've ever done before. So again, my optimism is high because we are talking, which I don't know if necessarily before we were talking about the right things. And so that's, uh, that's encouraging for me. Absolutely. And I, I agree with you that the conversations that are being had in various workplaces through Zoom, our coffee chats done virtually are very helpful and very cathartic. But there are employees who may say, OK, we've been talking for a year and a half mm -hmm. at where we are. Where are we going? And do you hear that uh, chatter in your company, in your organization? And what is your answer to that? Yeah, I mean, there is no question it will never be fast enough. It will never be fast enough. You know, I think in past here, and we used to do what I would just call eyeball tests. You could look around and just sort of see what you saw, right? Oh, it, it looks like we're doing okay. Now we're getting deeper. And again, we're able to put facts to paper to say we're lacking here. And in order for us to improve, these are the actions. I mean, companies have to assess, they have to plan and they have to act. And you have to show and prove it to your employees consistently. So we have you know, dashboards that we've created internally. We have communications, again, that we send out weekly of progress. We've now put in place, you know, with Carlos Rodriguez, our CEO, as all leaders, we have objectives that we have to hit that our success as an organization will be sort of weighted <clears throat> upon that if we don't hit X targets. And it's not necessarily a number. It's just sort of the whole collective environment. We as a company will not succeed. And I think our employees have a belief and you can see it and it's infectious. And that's when you know that it's starting to work is when other people are starting to have the meaningful conversations opposed to just, you know, call it the, the C-suite. Absolutely. Absolutely. Having a lot of conversations with a lot of people is critical within your organization and outside of your organization as well. And Tim Ryan, I want to bring you in here to talk a little bit about um, what you it did at PWC early on a year and a half ago, what is happening right now? Um, and then take us a little bit through what's been going on outside of the organization that you've been working on. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. And thank you for hosting this. And to all the uh, people who are participating, thank you for investing an hour of your time. I'm going to go back to 2016 because I, I couldn't agree more with Charlie and, and Debbie. Back in 2016, when we had police shootings in Dallas, our employees challenged us after 20 years of DNI efforts they came to work uh, uh, Friday morning in July and couldn't talk about it. Like we, you couldn't talk about it. To Debbie's point, it was happening in small groups, but culturally we weren't talking about it. We shut our firm down on July 1st, uh, July 21st, 2016. And we had a day long discussion on race. That was a foundational change for us. And over the last four and a half years, we now regularly talk about it, not because me or my leadership team say here's a day, it's now happening naturally. And culturally, it's taken four, four or five years to get to that point, but I'm proud of that. In uh, 2018, we had one of our own Black professional, professionals shot and killed by the police, both in John and Dallas, when he was watching a Thursday night football game, and he was killed and murdered. But what was the silver lining in Bo's death after two years, we knew what to do as an organization. Unfortunately, George Floyd's killing and murder was simply another, yet another occurrence of that. At PwC, we had already been talking, like we had culturally become comfortable talking about these uncomfortable conversations. We had been making progress, but now directly to your question, there are a handful of things that have changed. Like Charlie, we massively believe in transparency. And in August of 2020, three to four months after George Floyd's killing, we achieved our goal of becoming the most transparent large company in America. We studied all the other companies around what they were disclosing around DEI, and we went three steps further around disclosing that in August of 2020. And to Charlie's point, we were okay sharing where we where we had made progress and where we had gaps, and we need to share it. And we need we got comfortable because that transparency is important to build trust, and that transparency is important to put self imposed pressure on getting better. In this past September. We did it again. So unfortunately, George has been killed you know, 15, 16 months ago. It's not even just last year. It's coming up in closer to two years than it is one year. 
in this past September, we did our second annual transparency report. And I'm very proud to tell you that in 14 of 18 areas that we disclosed, we made progress in a pandemic year. In four areas, we didn't make the progress we wanted and we laid that out there where we wanna go. What massive believe is in transparency. What we've also done is we made a commitment to help 25,000 black and Latinx students in underserved communities in high school to get them into college. And we've committed to hiring 10,000 of those and that is progressing nicely. We also launched a diversity and inclusion badge that our people will all learn earn, we will, we will launch that fully in, in April. And that's a 10 hour commitment over a year to learn and earn a diversity and inclusion uh, badge. And, and to Debbie's point, every one of our leaders now has dashboards on exactly where they are in their exact team so they can measure their progress. We believe in accountability, but we also believe in giving our leaders the right information so they can make the right decisions. That's all inside of PwC. To your question around outside, um, as John in his introduction said, we founded five years ago this group called CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion. When George Floyd was murdered, we asked all 2000 members, would you like to go one step further? We had 150 say they would, and we formed on October 1st of 2020, we onboarded 300 people from 150 companies to work full time on public policy to end systemic racism. We just celebrated three weeks ago, our first year anniversary that was all spurned by George Floyd's killing. And those 300 people from 150 companies have been working full-time on public policy. I'll give you one example of a success. In the infrastructure bill that is now sitting on Congress's desk, there's a $42 billion commitment in that infrastructure bill to get internet to underserved areas, high-speed internet to underserved areas. That the group doesn't deserve full credit, the group deserves um, significant credit for working with our public policy leaders in Washington at the state level and the city level to get that in. And that's just one of a dozen examples of how the group is now working on public policy. I think of that as a 300 person startup from 150 mm -hmm. companies that is working on the public policy angle with so many other stakeholders to drive the right public policy where focus in education, healthcare and public safety. Yeah, very, very purposeful, very powerful startup, I must say. Um, I, I want to go back to something that you said about transparency and accountability, because um, as you mentioned, transparency, Debbie, too, um, the accountability apart, who's accountable? You're accountable to whom? So once these, once the numbers and, and everything, the cover, the, the, the hood has been lifted on where we are, is are you, who are you hoping is seeing this and and who is then responsible for making sure that change is happening? Is that you? Yeah, great question. I'll give a holistic answer. When you look at PwC, I, I am ultimately accountable to, to our board, who I, who I serve at their privilege. And I meet with my board twice a year to go over where we are progressing, where our gaps are, what we're doing, and what I call the nuts and bolts of the changes we're making to drive the results that we want. I think that is clearly one important element of it. But there's a much broader way, Sharon, that I'm accountable. Our clients, we have hundreds of our clients have told us, if you don't bring more diverse teams, you won't get our business. So I'm accountable to our clients. We hire 9,000 people a year into our firm. I'm accountable to that talent. That talent has made it very clear if inclusion isn't a priority and progress isn't demonstrated, they won't join our firm. They'll join ADP or they'll join Prudential or somewhere else. So I'm accountable to that, that, that talent. Um, what I feel great about is where society is evolving, there are a number of checks and balances on leadership like me. There's the checks and balances of the board, which has kind of been around for decades and decades. But as society has evolved, customers and clients are also driving accountability and talent is driving accountability. And I think that's great. Yeah. And Charles, do you agree that the accountability comes on various from various aspects, but are, are you ultimately the person who is accountable? And, and you know, what is the what is the ultimate goal? Once you have um, now achieved transparency for the first time doing something at Prudential that you hadn't done before, um, now that the, the, the reports have been released and you have a, a schedule for when they will come out and when you will reveal um, the progress, um, are you the ultimate person who's accountable or, or, or is there someone else? Theoretically, I, I'm the ultimate person accountable, but I don't want to leave it there. I want every person in the firm 
to feel accountable. We're all accountable. We're, we're all colleagues in this. And if I'm the only one who feels the accountability, this effort will fail. So this, this is a collective effort by companies like Tim's, like Debbie's, like mine, uh, to, to affect change in, in society. And, and I want to take it up to that level because it's that important. And we as businesses have, I think, a critical role to play for all the reasons that, that Tim cited, but for so many others as well, to be role models. To, to be able to affect society. So it's a long way of saying, unless it's imbued in your culture, unless everyone feels the, the need, the imperative and the accountability, uh, then I, I don't think we'll make as much progress. It can't just be one person, it has to be everybody. Yeah, so um, you know, I'm asking that too, Charlie, because there have been a number of studies on diversity, equity, inclusion over the year that say, you know, it only works if the chief executive has the buy-in, if the chief executive is leading the change to really make real change. Um, but you've said in the past that you know diversity is relatively easy; it's inclusion that is the harder part, and and making that inclusive inclusive culture. So I'm curious if you would agree that that it it, it all comes down to the chief executive, or do, do you have to make sure that it is um, imbued in various levels within the organization for it there to be real change? It, it starts with the chief executive setting the tone and the priorities. But that's only, that's only the first step of the long journey, unless it is imbued in the organization, unless the organization feels it, unless the chief executive can get buy-in and support from all, all ranks in the organization, it's not gonna be as effective. You'll get some change just by definition, but you won't get sustainable change and you won't get fundamental change that you need which would be so different if you have everyone in the organization who feels the accountability and the imperative. Getting everyone in the organization to feel the accountability, um, to really want to enact change, Debbie, can be difficult. You have been at ADP for a large part of your career. You have likely seen several CEOs. Some maybe have been more committed to this issue than others. How do you, um, you know, make, how do you make sure that this is continuing if the CEO is not fully engaged or how do you encourage the CEO to be more fully engaged? And I guess yeah, I'm no, assuming yeah. that you would think that the CEO is the person leading the change. Maybe you'd say it, it doesn't come down to the CEO, but I'm just curious, um, again, having had tenure in a company and seeing yeah. his management styles, how you would say that plays out. Yeah, so, you know, I appreciate, obviously, for Charlie and Tim as, as CEOs, you know, I deeply respect their, their view, but I agree wholeheartedly, it doesn't rest only with them. You know, I think, you know, I report to a CEO, and I think our responsibility as a, as a member of the leadership team, as an employee of the company, I represent the CEO. So it's all of us, and I think one of the things that, you know, that Carlos has said pretty continuously is, act like an owner. You know, the CEO cannot be everywhere. And so I have a responsibility. We all have a responsibility to take the tone. I think as Charlie said, the tone that's been set and take that tone and now spread it amongst the organization. I said, I said earlier, for this to really have meaningful impact for all of us, it has to be infectious. It has to be infectious that we have a responsibility to act like an owner, to act like CEOs, because one person cannot change, but one person can start the change. And I think if it starts at the top and then it trickles down and, you know, to your point, Sharon, yeah, I've been around a, a bit of time. I won't say how long, let's just say a bit of time. And I have seen, you know, many CEOs incredibly passionate and very successful, but there are some that this is an uncomfortable topic. And you have to have the uncomfortable conversation, even at the top. You know, I can only imagine even for Tim and Charlie that sometimes having conversations with, you know, people of color or people that feel as though they're not included, that, you know, need to understand how their voice is being represented. So I think that's the opportunity that, that we have um, is really just sort of setting the tone, not just for the CEO, but for all of us. Hey, yeah. Sharon. It, yes, Tim, please. Could I, could I try to... Um, 
add a little bit of um, detail to this. I, I agree. I completely agree with Charlie and Debbie. And I'll, I'll maybe try to share a real example um, of where I think everybody owns it and where I think the CEO needs to own it. So when Debbie and Charlie talked about these days of understanding and talking about it, that, from my perspective, um, one person's humble perspective, that is on every employee. Like, to their, most companies, what I'm proud of is they've now created more forms, more opportunities to talk about issues around racism. Um, unfortunately, when we had Asian hate crimes over the last several months, like back in the spring and the, in the summer, they, it, it is incumbent on employees to show up. I, I think that, to Charlie's point, like the CEO can't do it all, and I agree with that. That, to me, is a good example. But let me give you an example where I think it's critical the CEO play a role. And I'll share with you a, a real example at PwC. Um, we, have, we have over 20,000 clients in the United States. Um, one of our, the rights that our partners have is they choose their team. They decide who's going to serve ADP. They decide who's going to serve Prudential. And they, they pick their team. They know, they know they need someone who's an expert in cyber, an expert in tax, an expert in valuing financial instruments and they decide the team. And as we studied our root cause of why we didn't have more inclusion, why we weren't making progress, what became clear to us is that our, the majority of our partners are white and, and you wanna help people and they were helping people like them. And after studying it and data and really analyzing it, we decided to take the right to staff and engagement a client away from the partner. Not, not because they were bad people, but because they had unconscious bias. I went to Babson College. I thought I was helping people who went to Babson College. Unfortunately, Babson College is similar to what it was when I was there, which is more white than it is black or brown or, or others. We put the staffing rights in the hands of trained human capital people so we could have more diverse teams. Culturally, my partners didn't like it. They understood it, but they didn't like it. When we did that three years ago, it was a very unpopular move. We explained it. We tried to help them understand the bigger picture. That's where the CEO has got to own it. Like, like, that, like I couldn't delegate that. I had to get buy-in from my team. But ultimately, I needed to be the one to take the hit, to say, you're changing the culture, which I was. It wasn't because anybody was doing anything bad. And I just share those, like in every company, there's dozens of those examples where, where I think that's where the CEO is going to say, after analyzing your data, I'm willing to make a change because the data drives me to a different way of doing things. And I just show that as an example where, where I think it is, I agree with Debbie and Charlie to share responsibility. I just share that as where I think sometimes the responsibility is more in the CEO and more in the individual. Hey, hey, Sharon, I appreciate you I sharing that because, because I was just going to ask you about kind of getting more middle managers involved in this as well. And, and Charlie, I'm sorry, you wanted to jump in? No, I just, I just want to uh, expand on that a little bit precisely to the point you just said, which is uh, I, I think you can't just use moral suasion, right? You, you, you have to push the organization. And, and this is where transparency becomes so important because if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And if you don't measure it, you or other colleagues can't be held accountable, but if you do measure progress and are transparent in the reporting of data, then you can build trust with all your stakeholders. So, you know, three quick examples. We talked about our sustainability report and, and sharing our data uh, with both our employees and all our external shareholders uh, and stakeholders. Secondly, we tied executive compensation to the achievement of our diversity goals through a modifier in their long-term compensation. We started that in 2017. So uh, before 2020, so we had one period then and now we're in another period. Um, and the other thing is uh, we get a lot of, um, we get a, a lot of credit for our board of directors. And we have been in the forefront of sharing information about our board of directors, which by the way is 82% diverse, our independent directors. Um, but we started sharing information years and years ago uh, about their experience. We put pictures in, we talk about who they are and what they've done. Um, and, and so I think having that transparency and also imbuing, again, the, the accountability down into the organization through tying uh, progress to comp 
will focus the mind pretty quickly. Very good point. I want to make sure that I get to questions from people who are watching, and I thank you all for being so engaged in this very powerful discussion. And Tina Reddick has a question for each of you on how do you keep DE&I initiatives from going stagnant? And what advice would you give a company that is in its early stages of DE&I? Tim? Yep. So um, I'll start with early stages. Early stages, I, I believe, like, like the team has said here, foundational is creating the opportunity to talk about it. It, 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 is, it is amazing the power of understanding. We, we all come with biases of thinking, I understand the problem, I know the problem. But if you're just starting out and you can go to the CEO Action website, ceoaction.com, there's hundreds of resources. If you're just starting out with the name of the company and the person you can call for help. Um, I would, but I would start out foundationally having on a regular basis conversations around what people are feeling, whether that is some a black professional, whether that is a white male who, who's trying to do the right thing but doesn't know the difference to, to, to saying died or killed or, or black or African-American. Like these are things we've got to get past and have these conversations. So that's my humble advice. Like you start with the conversations. I realize you got to go from conversation to actions, but you've got to start there and go to the website and there's literally hundreds of resources. Um, in terms of stagnant, not, not letting it stagnate, it, it, it is what we've talked about, measure it and track progress. Our recommendation is that every company at a minimum ought to be reviewing with their board annually where they are. I mentioned we do it semi-annually and I've also shared one of the big improvements we've made in the last 12 months is every one of our leaders has a dashboard and they know exactly where they are. We, we do that to inspire them to better leadership, but ultimately if they don't get it, that leads to accountability. But I think it has to be data-driven. Any Unlike, or it's no different than any other major opportunity that exists in business. That This has to be measured and tracked and progress needs to be rewarded if it's happening. And if it's not, you need to do root cause to understand why it's not happening. Thank you, Sharon, if I, Sharon, yes. if I could just to, just Please. to chime in. Yeah, yes. sorry. So, you know, what, what I would add on as well, I think one of the things that you have to be careful of um, and what I've seen happen is sometimes we're just quick to go to action. And I think the very first thing that you have to do is sort of assess the health of the organization. Where actually are you on the spectrum? You know, there are many companies that can come in and do education, a variety of different surveys, even unconscious bias training. I think that's that's sort of an essential. I think once then you've assessed the health of the organization, then you start to plan. And I think everything that Tim said then can come into play around dashboards. Where are you currently? Where are you underperforming? Where are you overperforming? And then I think the other piece that I, I have found within ADP that has been essential are these employee resource groups or business resource groups where you then start to get a forum of different collective audiences and voices, whether it's African-American, Asian, Hispanic, LGBTQ, et cetera, and you start to have conversations and then assess then your plan of attack of what do we wanna go after first? Because some of the other, I don't wanna call it mistakes or opportunities I've seen is we chase a lot of shiny pennies. You do have to get grounded with priorities of what do you go after first? Otherwise you start going after a plethora of 50 things and you do 50 poorly opposed to two great. So that would just be my, you know, my additional add to, uh, to the comments that Tim made already. Excellent. Um, Charlie, you have anything to add? Yeah, Sharon, uh, panels are, are kind of boring if you say you, you just agree, but I agree completely with Tim and Debbie. The, the only thing I would uh, what add is uh, to underscore what Debbie said, which is the, the importance of the business resource groups. Uh, over the past two years, they have been absolutely invaluable in terms of providing a safe space for communities to talk with candid conversation and then be able to have courageous conversations with senior management about what needs to be done. Uh, and, and I would just say that they have been extraordinarily important during this time. So all the other things that, that Tim and Debbie said, I, I couldn't agree more with in terms of resources, uh, transparency, all the things you need to do, but business resource groups have been invaluable. Yeah. So talking about business resource groups and the resources and transparency, we have to remember we're all coming from large companies. I say we too, as a 
person who works for Comcast, NBC Universal. Um, this question from Joel hits a very important point. He, of course, is thanking all of you for participating in such a dynamic roundtable. He said, while your efforts are outstanding, the reality is the majority of the population work for much smaller companies that don't have the resources that you do to take similar initiatives. Executives in these businesses are far more concerned about tactical issues of day-to-day -day operations. What can be done to implement similar policies within these smaller organizations? And Debbie, I wanna bring you in here because several of you've talked about dashboards, the importance of having transparency. I know that ADP has recently launched a, a particular service in terms of dashboard for DE&I. Could a smaller company use something like that? Can you explain that a little bit and, and perhaps any resources that a smaller company could be thinking about using? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's a great question and, you, and you're right. So one of the tools, you know, ADP pays um, over 30 million people, you know, uh, across the world. So imagine the amount of data that we have at our fingertips in order to help organizations and serve up what you just described, Sharon, as dashboards. And, you know, for what we do in terms of paying, it's all sizes. You know, we pay one pay all the way up to hundreds of thousands of pays. So size doesn't necessarily matter or dictate the uses of these dashboards. And so what they're doing is they serve up insights. So even as small as an organization can be, it can at least give you some insights in terms of how are you performing in certain job functions? Where are you underperforming? I think that the biggest power though, Sharon, for me that I've seen is we're giving you benchmarks though as well. So you could be sitting here, wherever you are, let's just say New Jersey for the sake of this discussion, and we can give you insights on how a similar job is paid, performing, what the diversity makeup is someplace else in say California. And so you can start to serve up those rich insights on actions and plans that are really very factual opposed to anecdotal. That's why I said the eyeball test is something that we tend to do maybe in small companies, but here's rich data that actually proves where your pay equity may be out of sorts for men and women, or again, for people of color versus people of color, so on and so forth. So. I think that's where we're starting to see. We give you storyboards. You can start asking questions on, hey, I have an aging retirement force. What do I do here? Am I paying equitably? Um, if you're thinking about expanding your location, I want to open up another location. Where's a good spot to go? Now you can get these dashboards that can give you the intel based off of the benchmarks that ADP has created. And I, I have to tell you, you know, since inception, which has been about a year or so ago, the usage of the tool and how we've expanded it has grown significantly. And these are insights from our customers and how we actually serve the community to help them in terms of just setting them up for success. So uh, big, big, big uplift for us um, overall. Yeah, and Sharon, real, quick, I... real quickly, well, just one quick follow-up, Debbie. In terms of a small organization and figuring out the cost effectiveness of this, Again, how do they pay for this? How do they how how do they make it make sure it's cost effective for their smaller organization? Yeah. So look, once you well, the the tool that we're talking about is called Data Cloud. Once you're in the Data Cloud, the dashboards and everything else that I just sort of rattled off is sort of sort of already inclusive in the cost. And so how you're you know sort of paying for it again is through these pay equity um, initiatives that I referred to, the various sort of, you know, EEOC dashboards that really in it, in the long run, obviously will give you back the return on the investment. But I think, again, whether it's a small company or a relatively large company, I think actually will set them up for success. Excellent. Tim. I was just going to say, Sharon, for Joel, I, I would encourage all the listeners, and I, I understand the challenges with small businesses. If you go to the website, ceoaction.com, there's, there's no cost associated with this. There are over 1,300 best practices in 14 areas, um, and you can literally see what companies are doing. I just pulled it up, whether it be metrics and accountability, microaggressions, race in the workplace, days of understanding, succession planning, responses to 2020 racial tensions, and you can see what companies are doing, and they want you to call them, um, and there's no cost. And this is why we did it. Like This is why people like Charlie and, and um, Carlos are part of this, where we're sharing what we're learning, the good and the bad. So everybody can benefit from this and it's all on the website at no cost. And I would encourage people to take a look at it and then you can pick and choose which ones you want to use and which ones apply to your company. 
And, and Sharon, in terms of, of the, the resources that, that Debbie and Tim are talking about, it, you know, this isn't just a, a moral imperative. It, it's a business necessity. And to get everyone to understand that they can actually do better um, by using some of these tools and understanding the issues um, is, is really important. And, and we fundamentally believe you can do better as a business. That the, then these aren't these aren't mutually exclusive topics at all. In fact, in fact, they're uh, they're sort of self generating and and help each other. Absolutely, and 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 Charlie, as smaller companies are resourcing and trying to find um, you know different vendors to work with or different partners for certain um, initiatives. That is another opportunity. I'm thinking that there may be many small business owners that, of course, are working with Prudential in various ways, um, that there are there are ways to to perhaps at a larger company to help smaller organizations too, just in also seeing what you're doing in best practices, but just in certainly working together on projects in a way where you're exempt where you're exemplifying what you're talking about um, from the C-suite in terms of what the company is doing in, in terms of DE and I. That, that's absolutely right. So we've expanded our, our vendor initiatives. Uh, we have invested in small companies. We have a $1 billion impact investing portfolio. We've invested a billion dollars in Newark, which includes small companies. Um, so we, we are fervent believers in, again, the role of business, not just Prudential, but all, all our companies, big business, to support smaller businesses that, that are coming along. And most, uh, I would say most, many companies have expanded their vendor management uh, policies and programs in this way. Why is it so important to do that? Why is it important for a larger organization to work outside of the organization in terms of advancing diversity, equity, inclusion for all? Is that to, to me? Yes, Charlie, sorry. Okay. Uh, I, I fundamentally believe that, that business has uh, an incredibly important role in society uh, as a role model, uh, and that we as businesses can help society in so many different ways, Wh whether it's supporting small businesses, whether, again, it's being a role model on certain inalienable rights that, that we all have, um, in, in terms of all the, the, all the things we've talked about with today with um, inclusion and diversity. Um, so I just think as role models, we need to lead uh, and to demonstrate our commitment to, to this topic uh, and to the issues we've been talking about. To me, that's, that's just a fundamental part of being in business and one of our moral obligations. Tim, you've outlined with CEO for Action uh, for Diversity exactly what you have been doing with that organization, what that organization has been doing in terms of working without outside of your individual companies, but then making sure as a whole you're doing more. For those who are listening and, and may look at CEOaction.com and say, wait a minute, there's something on there that even though there's so, so much information, I did it this way and I thought it worked. I want to share this information are you still looking for organizations to share information? How do you do that? Yeah, Sharon, um, thank you. Absolutely. We're, we continue, our goal is to democratize best practices for the benefit of all companies, exactly to Charlie's reasoning. Like right? This is the society, the right thing to do. By the way, it's how we get more growth out of our economy. I, I tell people, I happen to believe this is the right and moral thing to do, but if that doesn't get you, this is how we make sure our economy is sustainable, viable, and we continue to be the best country in the world to do business. So if, if the heart and soul doesn't get you, then the economics ought to get you. I, I, but it is clearly both. We're, we're very open to new members. Uh, by the way, since George Floyd's killing, membership doubled. Um, the number of best practices have doubled. And you can put that right on the website. And by the way, uh, next month and about two weeks, we have our fifth annual gathering of CEOs. And CHROs, unfortunately, will be doing that virtually, but we'll have over 1,300 CEOs and we'll have over 2,000 CHROs and CDOs. And again, anybody, there's no cost to anybody to do this, and they're welcome to participate. Excellent. And if you missed it in the chat, again, Tim, the website to go to to bookmark right now is? Yeah, ceoaction.com. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I want to just leave the final words, like each of you to just share if there was, you know, 
something that kind of motivates you each day to work and to continue to advance diversity, equity, inclusion. You've all outlined extreme steps and, and tremendous steps that your companies have taken over the last 18 months. But there has to be a guiding force every day for you to get up and want to do this every day. And so, Debbie, is there something that kind of is your mantra as you are working in this area? Yeah, look, I know that, uh, you know, now I'll now I'll share. I've been working at ADP for 30, 33 years. So this is the only professional job that I have. And I found find myself incredibly grateful for the opportunities that I've been afforded. And I do recognize as an African-American woman in a Fortune 500 company, I don't wanna say that that's rare, but I am very, very blessed to have the opportunity. So my, my purpose and point is forums like this, spreading the word, ensuring that we are communicating and having effective conversations that are going to drive what I feel is sustainable change. You know, this, this war, this race, as I think I've said before, you know, this isn't just about race, but it is a race. You know, we need to be slow. We need to be purposeful. And I don't think it will ever end as long as we continue to talk. And so when I, you know, call it wake up in the morning, you know, I want to make sure that I'm continuing to add value, continuing to educate and continuing to set up my company and others for success, whether it's inside the four walls of ADP or even outside. I think that's my responsibility um, as a leader and as a human being and as a black woman to really have my voice heard and see what's possible because uh, you know there is there is hope um, and my optimism again continues to run incredibly high. Excellent. And Charlie, what would you say is your mantra, your raison d'etre in the morning? So so when I get up, what I dream about and, and hope for uh, is the credential becomes a truly inclusive environment where, where each employee feels as if he or she is seen and heard and can bring their whole selves to work uh, and that they truly feel included. That's a really high bar. But if we can make progress towards that, then I think we will, uh, I will feel as if I have achieved some level of success. But, the, but that's, what, that's what drives me every day <clears throat> to make Excellent. credential and inclusive environment. Excellent, and Tim? Yep, thank you, um, I, I love both of those. Um, my, my mom who worked at a supermarket and we, we grew up um, very lower end middle class and was not college educated. She taught me you don't get something for nothing. Um, the reality is that what, what we need to do is we're making progress and I am optimistic but there's hard decisions that have to be made. Um, my, my hope is that 10, 20, 30 years from now, people look at the business community and the leaders and they say, we took on the hard things. No, nobody's gonna look back 20 or 30 years ago and say, wow, wasn't Tim great? You know, shareholder equity was at X percent. Like they're, they're honestly, that's that, like everybody does that. Like my, my hope is that people look back at this group of leaders and leaders like us and say, they, they did the hard stuff because when you do the hard stuff, you get something. And if you're not willing to take risk, if you're not willing to make the hard decisions, you're not going to get it. And so for me, it's the willingness to make the hard decisions. We sit in these seats for a very short period of time. The average tenure of CEO is five years, right? We, we sit in these roles for a very short period of time. And what motivates me is when people look back 10, 20, 30 years from now, they say you took on the hard decisions. Well, thank you all. And what motivates me is to have the opportunity to talk to a Charlie, a Tim, a Debbie, who are so committed and so passionate about advancing D and &E and I and issues that I've reported on and talked about throughout my career are now front and center from the C-suite in a way that we have not heard before. And that is a change, that is different, and that is making progress. And so John Schreiber, I thank you so much and to NJ Pack as well for inviting me to host this very powerful and very personal discussion about leadership. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, thank you so much, Sharon. And thanks to, to, to you, to Debbie, to Charlie, to Tim. It is rare to, 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 uh, to, have, to have a conversation that is both useful and inspiring, and you guys did it, so, so, so thanks very much. You know, Sharon, before we go, I couldn't help but notice in this spectacular library that is your background that there are two books that are face out. Can you tell us about that book? 
Well, one of the books is called The Big Payoff, and that is my personal finance book for couples or anyone. When I thought that I wasn't on the same page with my husband about our finances, I wrote a book about it and realized we really are. And the other one is by my author husband. Many of the books in here are uh, C.J. Farley. He wrote a book called Zero O'Clock about the pandemic, a novel for teens and young adults and the struggles that they're going through. We can't forget about them as we're dealing with all of the issues that we have over the last 18 months. Great. All right. So I encourage everybody to check those books out. Right. Um, so I want to thank everybody at home who uh, who tuned in or at the office, whether you're at home or at the office. Right. And I hope you'll return uh, when we uh, uh, continue our conversation around diversity, uh, equity and inclusion at our next Business Partners Roundtable, 9 a.m. on November 16th. And we will have the opportunity to talk with Tanuja Denny, who is the president and CEO of the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, and she will walk us through her work in transforming the foundation into an actively anti-racist organization, a process that has impacted everything uh, from the organization's leadership uh, to the direction of its philanthropy. Uh, look for an email invitation to that event in your inbox soon. Until then, everybody stay well and goodbye. Thank you.